is Keys to the Shop, Founder Friday edition. Today, we're talking with Klaus Thompson of the Coffee Collective. Well, hey, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Keys to the Shop, where we give you insights, inspiration, and the tools you need to grow as a coffee service professional. My name is Chris DeFirio. I'm your host for the show, and I really appreciate you taking the time to join us here today. If you're new to the show, welcome. There is so much to listen to, <laughs> over 400 episodes. You can find all of that at uh, keystotheshop.com. Of course, I would recommend that you subscribe to Keys to the Shop so you'll never miss an episode. And also, if you love what you've been hearing at Keys to the Shop and what we do, then I would love it if you would leave a five-star review or rating for the show over at iTunes. Um, It helps the visibility of the show overall, and it gets the information out there to more people. And I so appreciate all of you who have already done so. Now, Keys to the Shop also, on top of doing this podcast, offers consultation for you and your business. With 20 plus years of leadership experience in the specialty retail industry, it truly gives me no greater pleasure than to be able to help people build a thriving coffee business. So if that's something you're interested in, you want to learn more, just email me at chris at keys to the shop.com. That's C-H-R-I-S at keys to the shop.com. We'll set up a phone call chat about what might uh, work for you in your situation. At the end, the email for Keys to the Shop Consulting, chris at keys to the shop.com. Now, today's episode is brought to you by Prima Coffee. Prima Coffee is one of the world's best specialty coffee equipment suppliers because they not only curate the most amazing equipment from all over the world, um, constantly making sure that they are offering their customers the best, uh, but they also focus heavily on matching that equipment with their customers' needs. So if you're looking to upgrade your current equipment or just buy equipment for your soon-to-be-open first business, Prima Coffee is really wonderful for helping you get outfitted with the right gear for your situation. So when you go to the website, prima-coffee.com, you'll see not only awesome equipment, but you'll also see that they have a ton of resources to help you uh, use the equipment well, learn about making coffee and cappuccinos and um, you know maintaining the equipment. It's very educationally focused. And that's why I love working with them because they are about helping you be successful in specialty coffee. So if you're in the market for commercial equipment for your shop, I definitely recommend you check them out, prima-coffee.com. Today's episode is also brought to you by the Barista Series from Pacific. The Barista Series is an amazing line of plant-based performance beverages that are designed specifically for the very demanding specialty coffee barista. Um, And it's not only designed for them, but also kind of by them because there's so much testing that goes on in the field before anything is released onto the market to make sure that no matter what you get in your store, whether it's the almond, oat, rice, hemp, or soy, you'll be getting a product that truly performs on bar. Any of these products uh, stand up to the heat from steaming. They have amazing silky texture, perfect for latte art, and keep the balance of the beverage focused on coffee. Your plant-based customers will absolutely love you for carrying the Barista Series in your shop. So I highly recommend that you get this in your store and try it for yourself. Find out more information at their website, pacificfoodservice.com. Com. Follow the link in the show notes for the best plant-based beverages you could offer your guests, the Barista Series. Again, that website, pacificfoodservice.com. Okay, everyone. Well, today we are in for a treat because we're talking with the co-founder of the Coffee Collective in Denmark, Klaus Thompson. Klaus is also the 2006 World Barista Champion, and the Coffee Collective was founded in 2007 between himself, Peter Dupont, and Casper Engel Rasmussen. For 13 years now, Coffee Collective has been an inspiration to retail roasters all over the world. They have a steady dedication to transparency, sustainability, and responsible growth in their uh, retail and roasting businesses. And again, from the beginning, they've pursued being sustainable in a, a broad sense. It derives from their belief that it's extremely important to show respect to the farmers, their employees, and their customers, as well as the environment and society in general. I've really enjoyed watching the evolution of Coffee Collective over the years. And in this conversation with Klaus, we take a deep dive into uh, his history in coming into coffee, founding the company, the hardships of the first year, all the lessons that he and his co-founders learned in those really formative first years that led to the scaling of their business and the growing of their influence and impact on the entire supply chain 
and what other shops around the world are doing. And this conversation has a broad range of very practical and really helpful values-based um, elements to it and that I think is really going to inspire you. It's such a pleasure to have Klaus on the show. I know you're going to enjoy this interview. So without further ado from me, here now is my conversation with the co-founder of Denmark's own coffee collective, Klaus Thompson. All right, Klaus, welcome to Keys to the Shop. So thrilled to have you on the show today. Thanks. It's a pleasure to be on here. I'm grateful for the invitation. Uh, absolutely. So uh, we have so much to talk about. It's been 13 years since the formation of the Coffee Collective. And um, I, we were talking on the way up to this conversation here over email about how uh, we were at a similar throwdown uh, intelligentsia in 2007, which uh, consequently yeah. was the year that you founded uh, the Coffee Collective, which just blows my mind that it's been that long. And there's a lot that's yeah. happened since then. Yeah, it's quite quite a while. And I was actually, uh, as, as we were emailing back and forth, I actually had to go into my old Flickr account <laughs> and dig through pictures. And I found that latte at Throwdown. And it's amazing to see how many coffee people were at that event and how many have gone on to have successful businesses. So yeah, it was a, it was a golden days. Yeah, absolutely. Just a throng of, of people yeah, that are identifiable now today. It's very, very peculiar to take a look back in time like that. But, um, and that's what we're going to be doing today, actually, you know, just kind of learning a little bit about your, your company, which is one of the world's best roasteries and certainly one of the most admired. And you had this career in coffee before you started the Coffee Collective. And I wonder if you could just fill us in a little bit on how you managed to get yourself into coffee and then um, from there decide that founding a company was a pretty good idea. Yeah, I, it all kind of started with uh, with a like a regular barista job uh, at a Starbucks, actually. I wonder how many World Barista Champions started at Starbucks, actually. But uh, <laughs> I, I moved to London back in, this was around the year 2000, maybe 2001. I actually forget now. Um, and I moved there and I, you know, had to get a job and pret which is a big uh, chain, were always hiring and Starbucks was the other company hiring. And I'd met Starbucks from living uh, abroad in the US, uh, just outside Washington, D.C. for a year. So I kind of was familiar with the intimacy of the Starbucks experience and everything. And so I got a job there and uh, worked there for a year. It was it was interesting. I loved the like the interaction with guests. Uh, I actually had training on a Lama Soko dialing in espresso, like it's that long ago and uh, <laughs> had coffee tastings, remembering that I thought it was impossible to taste the difference between the different coffees. I all like thought they all tasted the same. Uh, and I thought like the fault was on me, which I later realized it probably wasn't. Um, but my real sort of, how to say, like into the rabbit hole kind of experience with coffee came later um, because I spent some time working in uh, in Norway and saved up a lot of cash and my then girlfriend and I decided to buy an espresso machine because we were kind of missing that whole like steaming milk and like brewing espresso at, at home. So I invested in an espresso machine and at that time I started like reading online um, what like what machine should I buy. I wanted to really uh, investigate what was out there and, and geek out and literally within a span of like three months i went from only knowing what starbucks had taught me to reading everything i could get my hands on online like getting books and just completely getting like into coffee as a obsession as the most nerdy geeky kind of obsession ever uh, and it was fantastic i loved every bit of it <laughs> but that was <laughs> like at that point it was really the the change for me that it suddenly became a hobby and I started studying and then um, in Copenhagen, there was a coffee shop. There was two like quite famous coffee shops and one was Cafe Europa, which at that time had already won, um, I think two, yeah, two World Barista Championships. Uh, so this was uh, Martin Hillebrand and Fritz Storm. Um, and they had like one profile. They were very sort of like high street, very sort of uh, visual um, kind of, very fancy in some ways. Um, there was also a lot of food and, and alcoholic uh, drinks in there. And the other coffee shop was this smaller one called Estate Coffee, 
that my brother had frequented quite a lot. And he was very excited and said, they are like, they're like you, they're like geeks. They really are into this coffee thing. So I applied there and got a job uh, just as um, Peter Dupont, which, who, who later uh, co-founded Coffee Collective with me. He was leaving to write his master's thesis uh, in Nicaragua about coffee. Um, so I kind of took over his position at that coffee shop and, uh, and was then pushed basically by the manager there to compete, which mm -hmm. I did the first time in 2004. And, um, and I won the Danish competition, placed third in the world, um, just I think seven points behind Tim Venlebo. And that was like the next big kind of catalyst into coffee, like experiencing that whole amazingness of this international coffee world of, of people getting together and everybody equally obsessed with this dark beverage um and at that point there was like there was no no point of return basically um so i decided to take a year off competing um watched uh, the 2005 competition in seattle took lots of notes went to my first origin trip to uh, daterra in brazil um composed a blend together with peter dupont and then um yeah then 2006 i won the world barista championship and that was basically my career before the coffee collective that is just an incredible trajectory uh from starbucks to world barista champion and the uh, people that you met in the midst of all of this it seems like there's a confluence of right place and the right time and um, I do remember, you know, a state coffee, like seeing pictures of uh, you as when you were, won the World Barista Championship, like figuring out like, oh, this is a state coffee. And it, it was just like the, the Danish powerhouse uh, in competition was very much a thing. Um, yeah. And yeah. so it was like, I think I was the fourth world or I was the fourth world champion uh, from Denmark. And this was at the time where I think this was like the seventh competition. So it was kind of kind of crazy in that way yeah yeah it's like iceland and strongman competitions <laughs> yeah, <exactly. laughs> um but so you you are kind of on the top of the well on top of the world literally i guess uh at this point in your career and you've got all these networks of different baristas and owners and uh, at, at what point in this journey as you have been crowned the world barista champion did you begin to think that the next logical transition was business ownership. It, it sounds like this might have just been something that happened in, in conversation with people that you met along the way. How did this kind of transpire? Well, that's exactly how it transpired, actually. It's, uh, I, I never, ever thought that I would be like an entrepreneur or like a, starting my own business. Uh, quite the contrary. It, it never really felt like that was my trajectory. Um, but as I was traveling the world, like after winning the World Barista Championship, I, I went to so many places and I got so much inspiration. I saw all these fantastic coffee shops and businesses around the world. And I thought, well, there's something missing in Copenhagen. Like we're really good at some parts, but there's other parts that are really missing. And, um, and for me, it was, it was actually driving with, with a colleague in uh, South Africa uh, who was taking me around to visit the uh, coffee shops there. And, he was asking me like, why don't you start your own? And I just remember that kind of epiphany moment that like, oh, yeah, maybe, maybe I should. Mm. And I, I, yeah, it's, it, it's kind of weird. And I, I thought, well, that might actually make sense. And then, yeah, then I met up with, uh, with Peter Dupont when I got home and we, there was a Christmas party. And, and as those things goes, we started talking about all these dreams and ideas we had of how we could improve, like, the yeah the whole coffee chain basically and from that like the idea of the coffee collective grew in the beginning as just all these ideas we had for what we wanted to do with estate coffee but then slowly realizing we we have to start our own um if we're going to realize all those ideas well um and is that just because the establishing of the momentum of that business wouldn't allow much flexibility yeah, I think the owners were like, they were kind of split. There was the, the CEO of that company was a co-owner and he had like a strong sense of coffee, but there were two other owners. One was a, is a food entrepreneur who were doing like a hundred different kinds of businesses. He's a very intelligent and a, a guy I hugely admire, 
but um, but his focus was never on the coffee side and the third investor I don't think I've ever met. So it was kind of like you just felt, well, if we're going to do all these radical ideas we have, we need to do it ourselves. There's, there's just no way we're going to shape that company into, into doing these things we believe in. What was the first step then when you, when you had the epiphany and you, you turn ideas into actions? What were some of the first actions that you took to, to make this a reality? Well, it began with uh, Peter and Casper and I meeting up and discussing what would like the dream company be or what would the ideal thing be. And at the beginning of the, the blank piece of paper was this idea about the, trying to transform the, the way coffee business is done based on the experiences we had in the past. Um, we, we saw a coffee chain that was really broken. We saw that there was way too little value getting out to farmers in one end. But we also saw that consumers in Denmark weren't really getting the kind of coffee experience they deserved. And we knew from being behind the bar that people here in Copenhagen really appreciated, you know, all the work that goes into coffee. They were willing to pay for it but they also really appreciate the whole story behind it. And they appreciate it if the money they put down actually goes to the farmers. So where a lot of, I think, business people or business entrepreneurs like have a tendency to undervalue what the consumers care about or what they're willing to pay or what they're able to taste. I think we had the, the opposite kind of impression that people are a lot smarter than, than a lot of businesses give them credit for. So we started with thinking about what would our dream company be? And it would be something that encapsulated the whole uh, journey from seed to cup, to use a popular expression. Um, we would really want to engage a lot more with farmers in one end, making sure that we actually get a personal relationship with farmers and we invest back that way, but also taking it all the way to the brewed cup, to the guest at the other end. Um, which was something that, you know, at that time already, you know, hundreds of businesses were doing in the United States, maybe. Maybe not hundreds with the farmer engagement, but a few were. And nobody was really doing it in Denmark at that time. So I think that's, yeah, that was the first kind of a step ahead. Okay. So kind of establishing the values of the company and the, the end goal that you're going to shoot for by, um, you know, coming together and informing this company. So, it sounds like you're because I know you focus hugely on hospitality and and serving mm -hmm. others through what you do and having that focus on both ends of the value chain seems very very it's admirable and necessary um, and so when you're taking the first steps like establishing yourself as a roastery I guess first because you didn't open a retail expression um, well you did pretty soon but you started the roasting first I, I guess did you have to secure equipment at that time was it you had to procure loans to get this thing started like what were some of the practical things that you had to do in that first year to start those dreams on their way yeah i mean that was that was a huge challenge and we we started out we had this idea of like a roastery and a coffee shop together and you know importing business and traveling to origin and everything we met up with a with a bunch of different banks and this was before the financial crisis mm -hmm. it's important to understand and already at that point every bank we went to were hugely skeptical as soon as they saw something that had the word cafe on a piece of paper <laughs> they were like no 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 that's the that's bankruptcy business that's and you're four young guys you have nothing you don't have any investors they were i can kind of understand their skepticism but it was, I remember it as being hugely frustrated because we had this idea. We really believed in it. We knew it was going to make sense. And all the banks we met with were just like, no, 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 this makes no sense. We finally found one bank that were willing to lend us money for the wholesale part of the business. Uh, they didn't believe in the coffee shop part of it. Um, and that allowed us to buy a roaster and set up a small roastery in basically a storage facility out close to the airport in Copenhagen. Uh, and then it allowed us to buy our first two coffees directly from farmers, uh, one in Guatemala and the other one, Daterra, actually, in uh, in Brazil. Um, and that was kind of the, the very start of it. Did you uh, have people already interested in wholesale from you at this time? Like, were you marketing the fact that, you know, we're, we're a company, we're forming a company, we don't 
have a roaster yet, but when we do, uh, we are going to want to, you know, obviously you're going to want to move the coffee. So how did that, how did you find buyers for this coffee? It's a huge risk to take some of that startup money and buy direct from farmers uh, because that's more expensive to do it that way. And how, how did you move that coffee once you got it? Well, honestly, we didn't. It just sat there for a long time mm. because we didn't have any wholesale customers. We hadn't secured a wholesale program or made agreements with with cafes or anything prior to setting up the business. We were kind of just, you know, product first, let's go into this on like guns blazing. And then we had hoped that a lot of people would join on board because I think our quality was a lot better than most of like the places uh, wholesaling coffee at the time. But um, but even when when people tasted that and, and agreed like, oh, this is like absolutely stunning quality, they would often say, well, but I don't really see my customers paying more for coffee, so I'm not interested. And we had a very frustrating first half of year of trying to get up and running uh, just with wholesale. Um, Casper and I were driving around, knocking on doors, visiting cafes and coffee shops and restaurants, and it felt like so much rejection at that point. Hmm. We did get a few who were interested, um, probably like heard about us through the grapevine or something, but. But it was like um, it was actually a very tough half a year or almost a full year of uh, in that beginning, and um, and I remember like after half a year we were looking at the numbers and just thinking, this is going straight for a bankruptcy, and we we didn't pay out any salary to to any of us. We decided let's let's see how long we can live with no salary. <laughs> um, and of course, that wasn't sustainable in the long run, but the the real sort of how do you call it, tipping point, um, was actually then after half a year looking at those numbers saying like, we got to do something drastic. Either we close shop or we go and open a shop, an actual coffee shop, because we need to generate some direct income. Um, and that made us uh, sort of take a leap of faith and say, okay, let's, let's try it out. And we had had a little um, farmer's market booth uh, on a small street called Jersborgade, uh, that at that time were pretty much only known for drug dealers. Um, but it meant that the rent in that street was very low and there was a, there was a board on this uh, co-op buildings in, in the street that were very interested in getting young businesses in because they thought that was the way of transforming the street uh, to something more positive. So we signed the lease there and then moved from, uh, from our roastery location in there and we had actually already bought a small two group uh, Lama Soko so we could move that in and with a super limited budget we built out our first coffee shop and and that was actually when the business started to turn into something positive also for wholesale because at that point wholesale customers were able to come in and actually get that experience and you know see latte art in a cup taste the proper brewed espresso have that full experience of what coffee can actually be rather than us trying to push them into buying. Um, so combined with our, like the actual sales from selling coffee in the shop and then more wholesale customers, we, we began to actually make a little bit of money. Wow. I mean, it, this is, it's fascinating because here you are a world barista champion and you're, you're established coffee professionals in a relatively small country. And you would think that the road to success would have been a little bit easier than that, given your reputation. There was something absurd about it too, that like we had people visiting us, even at that location at the airport, David Macon from Australia came by and visited. And there were like numerous people from abroad who would come to visit because we had this international network. And I mean, people in the United States were reading our blog and commenting, but it wasn't really getting that much traction in Copenhagen until we had that coffee shop. Mm. As soon as we opened that, we had, you know, accessibility. People could actually come in and visit us and see what we were about. And it was definitely a, you know, marketing by, uh, by word um, thing happening. It was like people talking about this weird little place down on this weird little street. And they were like roasting coffee in the room and you could see the coffee being roasted and it smelled amazingly. And so it created that kind of hype that, that started to draw people in. Um, so yeah, so it, it started to make sense at that point. 
Yeah, that is definitely the way it seems to work with retail expressions being that calling card, the business card of a roastery. And so many people mm -hmm. that are just customers, you find out, oh, they own a hotel or they are eventually going to open a restaurant and they remember you serving them coffee and it generates so much wholesale business for you. Um, and it's a shame that the bank didn't believe in you <laughs> enough to yeah, let you do the retail. <laughs> but but thankfully we could like with the with the thing we had we could just do that coffee shop and we didn't even ask them. I think after we'd signed the lease and and maybe even after we moved in, we told them, oh, we moved into this and we we now have a coffee shop. <laughs> uh. <laughs> and and I remember it as being like very like educational for us as well that every customer who would walk in that door, we were just dying to meet them and we were so thankful. For their business and i think it kind of laid a little bit like the the cornerstone for for hospitality and our approach to hospitality because like we really needed every customer who came mm -hmm. in and we were really thankful when we could actually count the till at the end of the day and see there was some money <laughs> do you think that some of your um i don't want to call it desperation uh but the urgency let's mm -hmm. say of those interactions was gener uh, generated um well, yeah, it was generated by the fact that you you needed to have those customers to keep the business going. But had you been successful right from the get go and had sort of a paved way ahead of you, do you think you would have sort of had the same expression of hospitality without having gone through the hardships of that first year? Yeah, I don't really, I don't really know. I definitely think that having some obstacles in those early days is hugely influential to how your business progress and what it ultimately turns out to be. Um, if we had had an investor who would just have thrown money uh, at us and made everything a lot easier, I don't think at all we'd be the company we are today. Uh, I really think that having those constraints, uh, the financial constraints, it pushed us to be incredibly creative in building our first coffee shop um, because that coffee shop had to double as a training space um, for our wholesale customers. And it was a fully functional roastery where we also had to package coffee. We had an office in the back room next to the, the customer bathroom. Uh, so all these things like pushed us to be creative in and not just, you know, hire a designer, come in, do something fancy, but make something that was very personal. And that's definitely a, a lesson that, that we even today, uh, we now have six coffee shops, but it's, it's kind of the same approach that we start with now is that we really want to be personal in how we create a space. We want to be involved in all the creative processes. Um, so I definitely think like having some constraints is actually very beneficial for creativity. Indeed. Yeah. And, you know, looking at, you know, the progress of your company in real time back in the day um, and seeing your first retail expression, not knowing the backstory of all the practical things that were just the, the constraints that forced you to have to do all these things in this small space. From my point of view, it was just like, oh, that's a really cool concept. And that was it. There's yeah. no, <laughs> but it's yeah. much more uh, gritty than that. It was just, yeah, it was just like out of necessity. It was such a small room. So we had to place the, the bar against the wall. And I remember thinking, ah, oh, this is never going to work. because <laughs> like people are used to coming into a bar and, you know, you're on the other side and so on. And, but thankfully, my colleagues actually pushed me like in, in that uh, way. And, and it worked really well because it was this, this feeling for, for customers walking in that they came into this kitchen. And sometimes they look completely confused. They're like, did I walk in the wrong door? Mm -hmm. And then you'd, you'd be right there next to them and grab their attention and be like, no, no, like we're here to take care of you. And this is the roaster and so on. And, and there were so many like opportunities uh, for engaging with people like they would see the green beans and ask like what are those white things and you'd be like well that's actually how coffee looks before it's roasted and so on so there was all these conversation starters that is is something that still we try to to think about today is like how can you get people curious about the product or get curious about brewing or something so that you can have a little bit more engagement with them without forcing it love it love it so now, what point did you decide was appropriate to start scaling the business? And how did you go about that? Was it an opportunity that somebody presented you? Did you go hunting for more retail spaces? How did that kind of unfold? Well, it seemed like uh, it was always a plan from the beginning without us ever really discussing it. But I think we all had this desire to have more than, than one place. 
And um, because we had put a lot of emphasis on traveling to origin and engaging with farmers, we also had that experience that when you're talking with a coffee farmer and you're buying 10 or 20 bags of coffee from him, it's, it's even though you're paying a high price, it's not really like putting a lot of dollars in his bank account. Um, so we had this desire that if we can grow the business, we can scale it, then we can buy more coffee from these people. We can help them even more. Um, and the more coffee we can buy from one farmer, the better it actually is for his business, the, the cheaper it will become for transportation and the better the quality will, will be over the course of the years. So that was very much our motivation um, for, for scaling the business. And then um, I actually had to go back and look at, like in some of our old blog posts because we opened a second shop that we closed after half a year that not a lot of people know about. Um, but it was in a, in a nearby town called Roskilde. And it was an opportunity that presented itself that we, there was a space with a very cheap lease. And we thought, well, let's try it out. We, we can buy another espresso machine and just try it out out there. Um, but it was never really the smartest idea from the beginning. I think we should have done a little more research on foot traffic and location and so on. Um, so after half a year, we could see that that business was just not going to fly. And we, we closed it down again. And for me, it's, it's one of the things that's, that's interesting is that we, we very seldom talk about our failures. But for us, like this was like year two of the business. That was, of course, a huge failure. And it felt at the time a little bit depressing to have to close something that we worked hard on opening. Um, but if I look back at it now, I think it was some of the best money we could have invested in terms of gaining experience and learning. We could possibly have done it cheaper. But we learned so much from that failure in terms of what do we need to look for in, in a coffee shop space? Like what are the criteria that, that will make it a success? And that list we use today when we scout for new locations. Obviously, that's the footfall and um, location to different uh, places where people gather, right? Yeah, footfall is like that, that's a massive thing. And you can, you can go look on a, on a weekend and there's massive traffic, but then... Is that traffic also there Monday morning or, you know, a Wednesday afternoon? Or is there, if there's space enough that you can actually like grow as your customers will grow? If it's too big to begin with, you might end up with a huge room that looks half empty. But if it's not scalable, then like you'll be there for one, two years and you'll kind of regret that you can't like expand the operation at all. Um, so there, there's a lot of, of details. I remember one thing that frustrated us was, we, we served really good coffee and we had like so many co uh, customers coming in and saying like, this is the best coffee we have ever tasted. And it was like the customer who were there were really, really grateful and super appreciative of everything we did. But like one block down the street, there was a huge cafe serving like Otter Swill. I have to say that <laughs> it was really undrinkable coffee, <laughs> but they were always full because they had a hundred seats in the sun outside. We just kind of looked at that and we're like, if we had just like 20 seats in the sun, that would make a world of difference because that's a bigger priority for a majority of people in that area going out is that they can sit in the sun and, and take a break rather than going into our dark little room and have the ultimate coffee experience. Mm, that's a good point. And the, you, so you get outside of your own head and your own ego as a coffee professional um, and the, think about what the people want, even if it's not your coffee necessarily that brings them in maybe it's what keeps them there but at the same time yeah. practically speaking if you want to run a business it should be um not so much about the ultimate coffee experience like you said um, but the ultimate yeah. customer experience right yeah and i think like we still to this day sometimes get emails from people who who came in the door out there and said oh when are you going to open again in roskilde like that's probably <laughs> not going to happen for a while but but so we had some customers who really appreciated it, but like you can't run a business from the same like 30, 40 people coming in once every second week or something. You need like a steady flow of people. So yeah, that was, it was a good learning experience in that way. And it's really great that you, it sounds weird to say this, but it's really great that you closed it so soon uh, because so many people might just stubbornly try to keep something like that open for years on end thinking in conventional yeah. wisdom. Well, you know, the first year is always the hardest. 
uh, second year is going to be better. And then you kind of get that sunk cost syndrome where you just keep on putting money into it. So in your comment about being uh, an experiment or, or great experience, it really seems appropriate because the first retail expression was put together in a way that seemed just so organic that this was your first attempt to create something from scratch. And yeah. this the third store, I imagine, benefited hugely from your experience. Like, what did you change and how did, besides what we had just talked about, where the footfall, et cetera, what kind of uh, structural changes did you make to the third, I guess, store, or officially the second? Uh, yeah. <laughs> the so first the, didn't The have. one that I call the second because the, <laughs> yeah. the, the first second didn't work out. Yeah, that was like uh, we we had we had we were of course looking for new opportunities. And the the one thing I'll just round off Roskilde with was that when we closed that shop and we we felt we all came back to Yesbergade because that was the other experience that we were kind of divided a lot from going like to to another town forty five minutes away. Um, so when we came back, it was like the original shop suddenly escalated. Like we had the best summer ever, and it got super busy and also provided us with the funding for opening the, the next shop. And that shop was a, was, is a funny place. It's a food market that had been like 15 years on the way and finally came to fruition uh, that year. And uh, we had followed the, like, the ideas of that project for quite a while, but we're still in doubt. Uh, it was still kind of risky. A lot of people were saying, oh, it's never going to work. Copenhagen can't have a food market of that sort. Uh, but um, we went looking at it and especially with that list of like experiences from, from the fail shop, we could see, well, we need like this actually matches a lot of the criteria and, but we actually going to situate ourselves or, or bid on a location within this food market. That is not the, the, what they think is the a location. It's actually sort of more the B location, but in our book, it was like the perfect location because it had the sunshine and it was in the corner and it has, accessibility from foot traffic and bike traffic. Um, and as we opened that shop, it, it was like it blew us out of the, the sky. It was amazing. Um, I've never seen anything be so busy from day one. <laughs> um, but also it was the most challenging part of our, our business, I think, or the, in the history of the business. Why was it so? It was it just the rapid growth of your, your um, customers at that location that forced you to change things about your operations what was the most difficult part about that it was definitely the the fact that we went from being the four of us you know the four founders and then maybe a staff of like four to five people that you know we were friends with and we worked with every day to suddenly have to hire so many people uh, like i think 15 people so you know it doesn't maybe sound like a lot today but when you go from you know, being a small group of people who know each other to suddenly hiring all these people and train them from scratch and everything. That was a, a pivotal moment um, for, for our company. Um, we were so busy from day one down there that, that Peter, who is the CEO, he, he had to just leave all his work and just go make coffee in the coffee shop. And remember like the pile <laughs> of paper on his desk, physically getting higher and higher for every day he was away. And, uh, and so we had to, at that point, really to, to become a lot more professional and a lot more um, efficient in the way we, we did business. Um, we clearly had to, to have more people who were able to train and we had to have a manager for each shop. Um, and that was, uh, that was something that was probably already like in the pipeline, um, but that pushed us to, yeah, to get, get going on that. So you have these values as owners that you organically just live because you've lived through this business. You've been friends for a while. Um, it's easy to do that. Now, when you scale with 15 people, you're hiring and delegating authority to managers for each shop. How do you go about infusing the culture uh, and the operations with the values that you want to be communicated through this store with all these people having their eyes on your brand. It's almost like the coffee collective is being seen for the first time. Uh, and that's a yeah. lot of pressure. So how do you go about that? Yeah, that was very much the, the thing we had is that, that there was a huge interest. There was a lot of new customers. We also realized that there was actually a lot of returning customers, people who knew us from the small shop in Yesberg, but 
maybe didn't go to that neighborhood very often, but since this food market was so centrally located, a lot of people like now had daily access to it. So again, it's the accessibility that kind of pushed the business. Um, and then, yeah, as you mentioned, it's a huge change going from being next to your core staff and sort of sharing your values on a daily basis, kind of showing like, this is the way we talk about farmers and about the coffees, about the taste experience. This is the way we greet and say goodbye to every guest and so on. And suddenly when, you, when you're not there next to the other staff members every day, you need something to replace that. So we of course need to think a lot more about uh, creating lists for people and, um, and making a staff book. Um, those kind of things became more important to have a system in place that can replace that sort of soft value transfer. Um, and so that, that was one of the things we did was starting to write down more things, um, but also having a manager for every shop so that we had a system in place that somebody there needs to have that daily responsibility. Um, and that's something that, that over years have just grown and grown um, in terms of how we approach onboarding everybody in the in the organization right so it sounds though that you did a fairly good job at that i mean in in hiring people uh, the right way and onboarding them and obviously you learned along the way but uh you got you know peter out of, out from behind the bar eventually right yeah we did <laughs> he, he returned to the office as we hired more people but i'll also say that that having to hire so many people at that point and not Honestly, looking back, I don't think we were very skilled in hiring, to be honest. Uh, I think we were lucky with, with some people, but there were also challenges. Um, there were group dynamic things that, that needed to be addressed. Um, and everything worked fine, but, but I do think sometimes like service, especially to, to guests, could have been a lot better at that point. Um, and I think we, yeah, we, we learned a lot from that over the years, for sure. So store three, store four, and now you've got six. Um, imagine that you're using somewhat of a similar uh, a system for onboarding as you uh, invented for yourselves in this uh, venture at the food market. Um, and so it, it probably has gotten easier for you as you've added more locations. Yeah, and I think like it all begins with hiring, of course. And I think the, the team that does the hiring are incredibly good now. So every bar manager gets to hire for their own shop. We think it's it's really important that they get to set their own team um, so that they feel like it's not like they just got a barista in from, from someone outside who decided now, now you're going to work with this person. They, hmm. they have to have that ownership of it. And then as we grew, we were also able to, uh, to promote one of our baristas into an actual HR position. Uh, Michaela, who, won, uh, who is a talented barista, and she won uh, the silver medal in the World uh, Brewers' Cup That's right. competition. Um, and she's full-time on uh, human resources. Um, so she'll do the hiring together with the bar managers. And then we, we, have, we have, from the beginning, we've had a pretty solid training program that, um, that has always been sort of like the core foundation for every staff member who starts uh, going through um, what happens on farm level? What does producing coffee actually look and uh, look like, and what does it entail? What is processing, drying, moving coffee, and so on? Um, also, the company history, uh, as well as coffee tasting, uh, before we move into espresso and milk and black coffee, and so on. Um, so, I think that that very sort of structured approach has really helped us over the years. That we make sure we have everything covered really well. And to this day, it's, it's most often it's Peter doing the first course uh, that he will sit down actually with every barista and I'll do most of the espresso trainings myself as well. And I think that's, um, I mean, it's not that I'm anymore the best person to give espresso lectures probably, but there is something about that, that feeling that we are there and they meet us and like we are still interested in every person that is hired that I think it speaks something about like that, um, what our values actually are in, in terms of the staff. That's interesting. Uh, a centralized training model. I actually like that, that even though you don't necessarily have to train everybody in espresso because those who already know could potentially do that themselves, but it does help everybody learn the exact same way across the company. Yeah. And I think that's very much the case. Like we've had like, 
incredible baristas, people with you know experience from abroad and so on. But we actually cover all the same things with everybody. And of course, it's a little easier if people have years of experience. But but there's something to say about like we can cross everything off the list and we can talk more about why do we do things a certain way compared to others. And it's not to say that's wrong or right, but we like people to understand what our approach is in, in all cases. Right. Um, and you, your company is very much, like we said earlier, that's focused on both seed, from seed to cup, the farmers and your staff and your customers, both ends of the supply chain. And so we've talked a lot about mm-hmm. the uh, retail. And I would like to hear a little bit about how, as you grew your company and the wholesale grew and you were able to do more uh, as you had wanted to for the farmers, buy more. How, I mean, how did this part evolve and how did you scale that? Yeah, so the way I, we see it is we have three sales channels. We have our own coffee shop, we have a wholesale program, and we have a web shop as well. And the web shop actually uh, was the first place you could buy our coffee um, because we wanted that uh, possibility to exist for people um who are somewhere, you know, in like way outside of Copenhagen in the countryside, but who would like to treat themselves to some nice coffee, would like to be able to send coffee to them. Um, and we have prioritized over the years those different departments by having a, a, a dedicated wholesale manager and dedicated web shop manager, and also now a, a general manager for all the coffee shops. Um, and so that, that each of those parts can, can grow and can be strong on their own. Um, I think our primary focus is quite often on our own coffee shops, but there's something really beneficial about having like those, those different legs to stand on. Um, it means that we can, can both buy more coffee from farmers, but we can also bring more and better coffee experiences out through a network of wholesale operations um, and direct to consumers through the web shop. Um, and I think the, the wholesale is like, I was in charge of it for, for many years and really enjoyed that interaction with restaurants and other coffee shops. And especially that part where you feel like you, you, you give a little, you give some of your knowledge, some of your experience, you help them set up a RO treatment for the water and maybe a good Fetco and an EK43. And suddenly they're serving some of the best coffee in the world. And it's, it's actually not that difficult. And so you, you give a little, but you get so much the, the other way. Right. And your involvement in purchasing coffees and traveling to origin and the, the sustainability efforts that you have on the farm end of things and sourcing, uh, that's developed hugely over the past 13 years. I mean, uh, like, where are you now in that? Like, what, what does that look like for uh, the Coffee Collective? Well, the interesting thing is that we we started out doing uh, so-called direct trade, uh, a term that has now been misused so much that most mm-hmm. have stopped using it again. Um, but for us, it was always really important to have that like traceability. Um, and it's, it's one of the things that we are still fighting for is more transparency in coffee in general. I have yet to meet a coffee roaster who don't think of themselves as paying a good price for coffee. But I have also yet to meet coffee farmers who think they're getting the value they should for their coffee. So there's a mismatch for sure. And it it has been sort of the the fight for the last 13 years and the fight that we see continue is this this, uh, uh, absurdity that we can charge so much for coffee on the consuming end of things. And yet there's so little value actually getting to farmers on a global scale. Um, And we have tried to do like play our part in that in trying to to change things around by by putting a lot of focus on transparency and being an advocate for for groceries to sign up for the pledge that transparent trade launched um, putting prices um, paid to farmers on the actual bags as well as in a sustainability report where we have a transparency table so those are the kind of like you could almost call it a political fight that that we've taken upon us, um, but it's all with the with the purpose in mind that if we can bring more value back to farmers, we can also get better quality in the long run back to customers uh, in the consuming end of things. And if they get better quality, they will be willing to pay more for coffee, and then we have a positive spiral instead of this race towards the bottom that is far too often the case. Right. So your influence in the world market as a very recognizable brand 
you know, putting your money where your mouth is, literally, with these transparency reports and putting the price on the bag, people hold you accountable to that because that becomes the norm. Uh, but then you uh, imagine hope to influence a lot of other people in similar uh, parts of the industry, roasters uh, the worldwide, to do the same thing. Yeah, both specialty coffee roasters that I think should work on being more transparent, but also especially the larger, the supermarket chains, all these places where coffee is used to lure people in by having a cheap offer for coffee, then saying that, is that really sustainable? Am I actually also a consumer even getting value out of that? Is this the taste quality that I'm looking for? Is this the, the part of the world that I want to be part of influencing? That, yeah, consumer, that part is huge, right? Because that without them demanding from you the sustainability from the product, it really wouldn't take, like, it, it wouldn't be something that many, many people would want to do because it wouldn't be practical for their business or they at least wouldn't have customers really asking about it. So I guess the key would be to have consumers be the ones holding you accountable. Yes, I think I'm a huge believer in that, the pull effect effect from consumers demanding this from businesses and that becoming the new norm. Um, we've seen it happen with, with other products in, in Denmark is most of the supermarkets now don't sell eggs from caged uh, hens um, mm. or caged chickens um, because there was such a, a suddenly an influx of people talking about this and creating a consumer demand that, that said you cannot be selling this product. Um, so I do believe that consumer demand can actually change world yeah it, it, because it hits us where it hurts <laughs> if we don't right exactly <laughs> yeah exactly um so your sustainability efforts they're just constant you know from the very beginning of your company and you've constantly you know tried to kind of invest further as you've had the ability to do so uh the you, know, you became a certified b corporation um, is another step to that end. And I wonder if you could explain a little bit about what that means and why it made sense for the Coffee Collective to become a certified B Corporation. Well, it kind of began with us taking a, a grand look at the entire company and, and feeling that, well, we, we pushed this agenda about more value to farmers for a long time, but we are, we're actually trying to do well in other aspects as well. And we have from the beginning. Um, I think we were the first coffee uh, or multiple coffee shop place in, uh, in Denmark to sign a union agreement for baristas. Um, so there were, there were all these things we were doing. And then we, uh, we started noticing that B Corp was actually a way of structuring some of those things and becoming more inspired about what can you do in all aspects of doing business. Um, and it was a very long time from we first started to, to look at B Corp until we actually got certified. I think it took us over yeah, two or three years. Um, but it made so much sense for us. It felt like such a natural progression to, to sort of take on that commitment um, of becoming a B Corp where you look at the impact you have on the planet uh, in terms of social issues and environmental, um, on your local neighborhood, your uh, your uh, whatever communities you're a part of, how do you take care of employees? Uh, and also how do you actually run a business? Like um, taking a look at what kind of banking options do we have? Where do we put our pension funds? Uh, what options do we give to staff and so on? So for us, it was very much a 360 degree view of, of our company that we could also use to say, well, are there areas where we could improve? Um, so going forward, that is that's very much the case that we'll we'll be using this to see where can we do better. Right. So it it acts sort of as a uh, further set of accountability practices that you have submitted to in order to receive that court, that certification, rather than uh, just holding yourselves accountable. It's sort of the, a third party. Yeah, and then it's it's also it's a cultural thing I think because one thing is that you actually write into your company bylaws that you, you, uh, you cannot just put profit as your end goal. You have to, to take into account how you running a company, making a profit impacts the planet. Um, so suddenly you're accountable to that. That means that um, like B Corps, if they have investors from outside, they know that they're buying into this philosophy as well. 
that it's not just about creating profit. Um, and for us, like profit has never been a goal on its own. Like it has never been interesting to us to just make a company that would create profit. Profit for us is is something that we need to create to do all the fun parts, mm. do everything that we want to be doing in exploring coffee, going to origin, seeing that we can actually have an effect uh, on farmers' lives at the other end if we pay more and so on. But profit on its own has never been interesting. We'd rather invest that back into the business and and thinking about these things long term. Um, so B Corps, I think, in general, share that similar mentality. Um, and so for us, it, it just makes so much sense to to yeah to get into that. Man, yeah, absolutely, yeah. And I, I love that perspective that profit is just the thing that's needed to do the things that are are good and f- and fun and uh, impactful in the world. When you think about it, longer than a second, that's actually what you want the money for anyway. And I think for a lot of consumers, it's also becoming apparent that you actually have a lot of power as a consumer. If, if every purchasing decision you make, you, you have two options and one actually does a little better for the planet and the other does worse. And you always invest in the one that does better. There's a huge effect that can accumulate if everybody makes those kind of decisions. Yeah. And you're kind of speaking in a way that people speak about the customer experience in the shop where we dissect the... Uh, retail and we dissect the purchasing patterns and the impact that our our ambiance has on people's purchasing decisions. But in a broader sense, it's saying, recognizing that your company has impact beyond the walls of your shop and is part of what influences the sort of the the global norms in your, your market and in your industry. Yeah, I, I think coffee is such a great um, product in that way that we have we have a, like most people have like multiple cups of coffee every single day, and through that transaction, you can actually put money that benefits someone that does something greater for the planet. That's always been my drawing to to coffee. That I feel like it's it's it gives me something. It's a sensoric, pleasing, exciting beverage, but it's also a beverage that can actually help in some areas of the world that money is really needed. Your company obviously has been growing steadily and 13 years, uh, six stores. It's, it's a good amount of stores to have. It's not as many as some people have in the first year (laughs) these days. No, that's, that's, that's actually an interesting thing because I mean, there's one of the most, um, successful businesses in Denmark, um, is a, is a chain of juice shops and they, they are all over the world now. And we actually sold coffee to them in, in the early days, and it provided us with a good amount of cash flow at that point. Um, but we kind of like went very different directions where they really wanted to grow their business and be like worldwide and have, I think at some point they said they wanted to have 500 shops in five years or something. <laughs> and at the same point, we were looking at, well, that is not a goal on its own for us at all. Like we would rather take it one shop at a time and then, then kind of, He's into that shop, feel that we're on board and that the whole team is on board. And then we can talk about opening up a new shop. And of course, that gets easier. Like this year, during COVID-19, actually, we have opened, um, I would say, one and a half shop. Because one is very small. It's a telephone booth <laughs> right. uh, that is almost in conjunction with one of our other shops. Um, and then we opened shop number six uh, just about a month, two months ago, maybe now. Yeah. yeah, that is a very different philosophy, and I would argue probably a way more sustainable one, even though somebody might argue that, well, imagine the impact you would have with 500 stores, but maybe people aren't really recognizing the fact that those stores are destined to almost not be profitable. Yeah, and that's the thing. I think like we really want to scale our business, and we're not going to stop with the six shops, I'm sure. We, we, we still want to grow. Um but we don't want to grow and then compromise on the amount that we can pay to farmers or the kind of coffees that we're able to buy or the salaries that we're able to pay baristas. We really want all the quality aspects of the business to grow in a faster rate than we just grow physically. Mm. Um, and I, I'm really grateful actually for having a company that I share with, with 
two other co-founders today, um, Casper and Peter, that, that share those same values. And I think that's also part of why we have people sticking with us for so long. We have, um, I think, three staff members have soon here uh, have been part of the journey for 10 years soon. And I think that's that's very much because they know what we're about and that we share these um, these same values and visions for, for what the company can be. We've talked about the business growing and scaling. I, I wonder, as we wrap up here, how have you grown in 13 years? Uh, <laughs> you've, you were World Barista Champion. You started this business, and we've talked about so many ups and downs. And you, along the way, obviously, have, have changed in some manner. What, what does that look like for you? Well, I, it's fun to think about. Like I've, I've definitely gotten a lot of challenges uh, working with leadership and managing and staff and the social role in a company and everything. Um, I think some of the things that I take away is thinking back over the, the last 13 years is definitely like, being allowed to dive more into uh, to origin work, understanding more of what happens on farm level and diving into that aspect for me has been so educational and so inspirational as well. Um, it, it's like that really puts everything that we do on the consuming side of things into perspective. It's like when I come back from an origin trip, I always feel like oh, this is why we're doing it. Like this is what's so interesting. Whereas I'm, I'm, I'm sure a lot of people get it the other way. They, they see the happy smile on a customer's face, which also brings me a lot of energy. Um, but for a lot of people, maybe that's the way that, that they think this is why we're doing it, uh, where, where I think over the years that have transformed to, to the other end of the chain. Um, and then I think today it's my, a lot of my pleasure uh, in, in the work environment. I get out of working with really talented people in the entire organization. We have such an amazing staff that gives me so much joy coming into work um also meant that it felt horrible to have to work from home uh during <laughs> coronavirus yes. because i really really enjoy the social aspect of our company as well um and then i i think that looking ahead i think more and more it's the it's kind of the strategic thinking that we do on the board level of the company that i think is it's just really fun and challenging. There's, there's, uh, there's a lot of inspiring ideas there and there's a lot of way to work more on a strategic level that I think I get more and more into. Yeah, you, your inspiration is never lacking, but it's just coming from these different areas in the company that continues to grow. And I'm really thankful that we got an opportunity to go through all of the, the um, history of your company and we've learned so much we've talked about so many different things here uh, it's been hugely helpful so thank you um i want to just leave we everyone with a like i guess a final question to you which is um what would you say to owners and operators out there uh, roaster retailers specifically who are looking to make a difference with their companies and do want to It'll scale responsibly and and make an impact on the world around them. Um, there's probably many lessons that you could uh, throw their way uh, and advice you could give. But what would you say are some of the main things that you would advise them if they really want to go forward and make the world a better place for coffee in the future? I really think engaging more directly with farmers is hugely important. Um, go on those origin trips on your own. And go meet farmers as equals. Don't go as the buyer with all the money, but go meet them as equals. And think about what kind of transaction do you actually have? And how can you make sure that, that you pay as much as you can squeeze out of your own pockets? Can you really look yourself in the mirror and, and think that's a good price for this coffee? Um, and then I would say work on, uh, on transparency. Uh, I think every roaster, specialty coffee roaster, especially out there, uh, should go sign the pledge from Transparent Trade. Commit to showing the prices that you're paying, because that will allow us an actual conversation about what is a good price for coffee. Um, it'll allow us a conversation about what farmers need to make on their end, um, not determined by us, but determined by them as well. So that's some very sort of concrete uh, advice that that might not be so philosophical, 
but I think we need to start with some of the, the more hardcore issues when it comes to, to the future of specialty coffee. Love it, 100%. Uh, Klaus, thank you again so much. Uh, where can we go to learn more about the Coffee Collective? Well, you just look up coffeecollective.dk because we're a Danish company. We have the DK at the end. So uh, go check that out. We, we uh, also have a YouTube channel and you can find us on Instagram or uh, yeah, on my own personal account if you want to reach out there. Awesome. Well, thank you again so much for uh, sharing with us on the show today. It's been an absolute pleasure to have you on the show. It's been my pleasure entirely. Thank you for uh, having me. All right. Well, I hope that you enjoyed that episode with Klaus Thompson. Um, really packed with so much information. Um, the, just the lessons they learned scaling their company, learning as owners, and their dedication to uh, living out their sustainability values, both at the farm level and also with their customers. Uh, I really admire the Coffee Collective and what they've built there. And I think this company should be an inspiration to all of us. Um, definitely go to their website, coffeecollective.dk. And uh, you can also follow them on Instagram. And their handle there is Coffee Collective. It's uh, T I F, not T I V. Uh, and you'll find those links in the show notes as well. And uh, also links to related episodes. Encourage you to check those uh, out also. And a huge thank you to Klaus for joining us on the show. So grateful for a company like yours. Thank you for joining us on the show again. Now, if you want to reach out to me, if you have any questions, comments, or feedback about this show or anything else, really, you can send that to chris at keys to the shop.com. And uh, that's also the email you can use to inquire about keys to the shop consulting. Again, that is chris at keys to the shop.com. And with that, that is the end of our episode today. I appreciate all of you tuning in to the show. I hope you have an amazing week. And as always, I hope that this episode has given you keys to the shop. <laughs>